welcome back. And now it's on to the subject that everybody loves to talk about, the carburetor. Incidentally, my carburetor diagnosis and disassembly video and my idle speed mixture adjustment video is some of my highest viewed and highest rated videos. And I can only attribute that to people just are baffled by this thing. And here's another one off of this bike that we're working on. You know, it's got some unique qualities to it as far as how it's designed, but overall it functions exactly the same as any other carburetor out there. We got the bowl off our carburetor. We're going to clean it up, disassemble it, and clean it up and everything. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on actually how to do this because I have other videos that explain this and explain the theory of the carburetor and its operation. So you can go over and find those on my show. Uh, but I will uh, point out some somewhat unique things about this carburetor and its, its design. It, like I said, it functions exactly the same as every other carburetor out there. It's just the design is a little bit different compared to what you're mostly used to. Okay, just to show you some unique uh, design features on this carburetor that are a little more unique is you'll notice that the, uh, the uh, two floats ride on little pins that are in uh, in the carburetor bowl. Now typically, and if you watch my other videos, you'll see that the uh, floats actually ride and are attached on the arm. In this case, the, the carburetor float arm is operated by two little pins that are on the uh, floats here, you can see, and it rides right on them. Another unique uh, portion of the uh, thing that uh, makes this carburetor unique is actually how the main jet circuit operates. Because this is a rotary valve engine and this carburetor sits behind a cover and it's enclosed in the engine cases basically, there's a plug on the outside cover that you take that off and then to to access the main jet is by, by this uh, unique style of uh, banjo boat, bolt. And there it is, there's your main jet on the end of this banjo bolt that has holes in the end here. How it works is, you look down in here, there's one big hole right down there, and the fuel enters there, then goes into this chamber, then into this uh, depressed portion in the casting, which then is sealed by this O-ring, and then this is where the jet needle fits down into, and the jet controls how much fuel is allowed to flow into this portion, and thusly up into the uh, portion of where the uh, jet needle rides. And another interesting kind of feature of this carburetor, because it's in a sealed compartment within the engine and not externally, like outside, your, all the vent hoses have to be interconnected and then they run out and through a grommet in the case, which you'll see later when we get back to the engine and disassemb and assembling the engine back into the frame and hooking up the uh, fuel lines and also there's a vacuum line that operates the uh, fuel shutoff and more on that later. This carburetor also features an air screw. This is the uh, intake bell or the portion that if if the air filter clamped on here this would be the air filter side and you can see there's a screw right here this is an air screw um, so not, not a fuel screw fuel screws are typically found under here or on this side of the carburetor this this side goes directly towards the engine Well, 
that's all the farther I'm going to go in explaining how this carburetor operates. I'm going to get to disassembling it, cleaning it up, and verifying the specifications per the service manual. And then we'll be ready to start installing the engine into the frame and try to start this thing. We got the engine temporarily mounted back in the frame so we could hook it up to the wiring harness, coil, and CDI box, and we're here for the moment of truth, ready to hook it up and see if we have spark. Well, success! We have spark, so that means all of our ignition components are working as they should be, and to be honest, I'm pretty confident in my abilities, but this is the one thing that I was really worried about with this bike because these ignition components are, of course, obsolete and then very hard to find in working order uh, used in the aftermarket like eBay or junkyards. Um, and if these didn't work, I was really going to have to figure out an alternate solution. But success, we have ignition. Well, just a moment ago, you saw that we had spark when we put the engine back in, hooked up all the electronics and everything. I uh, got the carburetor back together. It's all clean. It's set to the factory specifications per the service manual. Uh, I hooked up an auxiliary tank and, I, and an auxiliary oil tank, because this is oil injected, so I can attempt to start the bike. Well, I tried starting the bike. I wasn't rolling the camera. Uh, I ran it, ran it for a few minutes, shut it down with the key, started it up, ran it for a couple minutes, shut it down with the key, started it up, ran it for a few more minutes, just kind of doing a, you know, light heat cycling to break it, break the engine in, and I went to start it up for a fourth time to then fully heat the engine up and uh, see how our tuning was, and by the way, it ran really good, but now I don't have spark, so... <laughs> This is something that happens along the way with uh, restorations, and it even happens to us. Uh, the so-called pros are experts, and I don't claim to be too much of an expert, but uh, I got some diagnosing to do. So actually, this is probably a good thing, because I get to show you maybe the ins and outs of uh, how the electronics works and how to go about uh, diagnosing an ignition problem. Well, over here on the other side of the bike, as you can see, I had it all hooked up so I could uh, try and start it and uh, after I primed the carburetor it started up second third kick after it got some uh, fuel into the cylinder ran great but now we don't have spark which I suspect because of the age of the bike that maybe my exciter and signal coils on the magneto are faulty or became faulty or they were kind of just within spec enough to give me spark and it to run and then run long enough to vibrate some rust or some corrosion loose and now I either have a dead short or an open short I don't know but we're gonna diagnose this and this is the part of <laughs> the restoration and uh, repair that I told you a few episodes back that you know before you start on anything you need the service manual and this is some time this is one time where doesn't matter if this was a modern bike, old bike, whatever. You gotta have the service manual because you wouldn't know how to check it or know what the specs are. I mean, you may know how to check it just from not general knowledge, but you won't know if it's in or out of spec because uh, you won't know the specs, I guarantee it. Uh, and, you know, for certain bikes and things, you may not be able to find it on the internet, so you're resorting to forums to try to obtain this information. So let's get started. Okay, I got everything set up here. I got my service manual open to the page. It tells me how to test the uh, windings on the uh, magneto. Also, as the table tells me, the ohm readings. Now, you're going to need one of these, a volt ohm meter. Uh, these can be gotten anywhere. They can be had for as little as five bucks. They're kind of a get what you pay for. Um, 
you know, the more expensive ones obviously are going to be a little more durable, a little more accurate, whatnot. But for these kind of tests, even the $5 ones are going to be uh, suitable. All right, for my manual, I'm going to test each one of the wires and write down what the uh, specifications I get on my readout here and then compare them to what the book is supposed to be and then I can determine if that's the problem and if that's not then we need to move on to other parts of the ignition system. All right, well, I've taken all my readings. I wrote them down on what the limits are per the manual and what each test uh, gave me. And here's the readings here. And it looks like they're a little off. Uh, the exciter coil was 147 ohms. Uh, it should be around uh, 220. These are all plus or minus 10% per the manual. Uh, signal coil is uh, 36 ohms. It should be 75. Uh, charging coil is 0.7, it should be 0.23. Lighting coil, same thing, 0.7, should be 0.23. Now, the charging and the lighting coils, I'm not too concerned about it at this point because I'm not really concerned about getting the lights working. And actually, those aren't too far off, so the lighting coil might be, you know, use, usable for this application. And actually, if this if I was converting this to make it a vintage motocross bike, I would probably just eliminate those coils anyways, because I wouldn't be using the lights anyways. But anyway, it kind of looks like uh, this is probably our culprit. It probably what happened, like I said before, is uh, some corrosion, rust, or, or whatnot, some degradation of the wiring and the windings in the coils. That's probably what caused this. And what this tells me is since the ohm readings are going down, it means I'm having more of a dead short. I don't have a dead short because zero ohms would mean I have a dead short, meaning I have it's grounded. An open short, I would have infinity ohms or it wouldn't even read on my scale. So that's kind of how I determine where to go with this. So I have the tough task of finding replacement parts. Now I do have three other bikes that I can rob from, so I'm going to do these same tests on the two other uh, components that I have, two other bikes, and see if they're any better. And if they're within spec, I'm going to have to swap, swap parts. Now here's the bike that I took the flywheel off because that one was missing it. And just to explain here, this, this side, this coil, this big one, this is the uh, lighting and charging coil. Uh, over here is, is what uh, the ignition uh, works off of. Uh, this smaller one here, this outside one, that's your uh, signal coil. Think of it like the contact uh, breakers on a breaker point. This is what is creating a small amount of voltage that then goes to the CDI box and tells it when to fire. The other one is the exciter coil. and This is what creates the voltage that then is sent to the coil to be stepped up to then fire the spark plug. So in my test, it's showing that both of these are out of spec and I'm hoping that these are in better shape or have aged better, should I say, um, than the other ones. Now, I will say, if you saw the first episode or the first and second episode of this, that bike there the uh, cover and flywheel was missing, so they'd been exposed to the elements for God knows how long, where this was actually behind the cover, magneto in there, so this was not exposed to the elements, so I'm going to hope that these are in better condition. If these aren't, I have one more chance because I have one more bike to uh, try and get parts off of. Otherwise, I'm going to have to find some new old stock parts out on the internet or from a junkyard bike and hope that they're better than what I have. Well that's going to wrap it up for this episode. I got some work to do diagnosing and replacing these parts but in the meantime we're going to finish stripping the bike, we're going to work on the suspension and we're going to start stripping the frame so we can uh, clean it up, get the bodywork started and then 
then we can finally start putting things back together, maybe for the last time. So until next time, I'm the Junk Man. Like my Facebook page, check out my website, and subscribe to this show. Take two. Three, two, one. Okay, I got everything set up here. I got my service manual open to the page that tells me how to test the uh, windings on the uh, magneto. Also has the